All right, so let's get started with our very first video lecture for chapter 15. We are now entering the early modern era, time period 4, which or unit 4, uh, which runs from the year 1450 all the way to 1750, right? Early modern era. And one of the biggest changes that we see in, in world history is the rise of Europe. And Europe is going to undergo massive political and religious and societal changes during this time. And they're going to begin to exert or expand their influence throughout the rest of the world. Primarily, we see this in their expansion into the Americas. But we also see that they're going to have influence in Africa and even in parts of Asia. Now, so let's get started with some of those um changes that Europe underwent. And the first one is called the Protestant Reformation. So going back to Christian history, right, we know that in 1050, the um, Christian church had split between the Western Roman Catholic side centered here in Rome and the Eastern Greek uh, church uh, centered here in Constantinople. Now, by 1450, Constantinople and the rest of the Byzantine Empire is gone, right? Conquered by the Ottoman Turks. So we see that the Orthodox Church loses importance, even though it kind of like migrates into Russia, into Kiev and Rus. But the Catholic Church of Western Europe is still up and running. But by that time, the Catholic Church had grown extraordinarily wealthy, extraordinarily rich, and in the process, extraordinarily corrupt because there was no supervision over what the church was doing because the church had final authority on all matters with the church no government uh, or kingdom can tell the church don't do this or don't do that uh, so for a while people have been saying look the church is doing things that aren't right right things that are considered corrupt and they need to be changed they need to be improved and a lot of these complaints came from people within the church itself say hey we're doing stuff that's pretty messed up. We shouldn't do that. Um, but these effects tended to not, you know, these attempts to change things or to reform tended not to be very successful. And uh, they also criticized other kind of like the beliefs of the church, right? Uh, so, for example, the church continued to use Latin as their main language like you know, when they would conduct mass in church. And the people, of course, didn't like this. They complained, why are we, uh, you know, understanding God in Latin when no one speaks Latin, right? Most people speak the vernacular languages like German and French and English and Spanish and Italian, right? Um, so there's a lot of criticisms about the church practices and the church's beliefs. And the problem is that whenever you criticize the church, you kind of draw a big target on yourself and you become an enemy of the church. And for most times, if you're considered a heretic, it's pretty much, you know, a death sentence because you're a non-believer, uh, because you don't accept everything the church tells you to accept. And the end result, more than likely, is that you're going to get burned at the stake, not even considered a witch. Now, at the same time that the church is growing extraordinarily wealthy and influential, right, uh, because remember, we're going to see that Italy is going to be very, very wealthy during this time. Um, and uh, because of they control that trade throughout the Mediterranean. Uh, but at the same time that it, you know, Italians are getting rich, the Pope is increasing his actual political power. So now he's not just the religious leader of the Catholic Church. The Pope has become like a state leader, a king, an emperor, or whatever, right? So people start criticizing, wait a minute, if the Pope's job is, you know, to worry about salvation of people on earth, of Christians on earth, why is he running a kingdom? Why is he a political leader? Isn't that, you know, not his job? Should he be focusing on the more important spiritual job? Uh, so there's a lot of criticisms going around. They've been building up for a while. And eventually we're going to see a spark kind of explode everything, which is what we call the Protestant Reformation. So when people, you know, are struggling day in and day out, when there's a lot of poorness, right? Because most of Europe was still pretty poor. And then we see these magnificent churches, extravagant cathedrals being built. Right? Like here we see this called St. Peter's Basilica, right? And it was in, in, in Vatican, right? In the Vatican in Rome, right? The headquarters of the Catholic Church. 
So people are wondering, how is the church spending so much money? Where are these, where is this money coming from? And it's coming from something called indulgences. And an indulgence is basically money you give the church, and in return you gain salvation. So that when you die, you get to go to heaven pretty fast, right? Because your soul has been cleansed of sin. So the Catholic Church is selling salvation, right, with through these indulgences. And this is not the first time it's done this. If you kind of go back to the Crusades, remember the Crusades, a lot of people went to fight because the church promised that if you fought on behalf of the church, you provided a service on behalf of the church, you get to go to heaven too, and your soul will be cleansed of sin. So it's the same idea that's been around for a long time, but now it's more of a financial thing, right? They actually pay money to build these churches. So, of course, this has been going on for a while. And finally, in the 1500s, you see this guy, Martin Luther, who Martin Luther King is named after. So Martin Luther comes around, and he uh, starts a reformation. So he's actually a German Catholic priest, right? So he's been a priest for a long time. He studied this for a long time. And he sees all the corruption, he sees all the problems with the church, all the complaints, right, that he has. And he writes it down in this long, like, list called the 95 Theses. And he complains about all the church is doing, especially the main one is the indulgences, right? And he says, look, I'm going to post these. He actually, like, nails it to the door of his church. And he wants everyone to read it, everyone to know about it, because he wants everyone to think about, you know, about their faith. Because for the longest time, since like, you know, for hundreds and hundreds of years, no one thinks about their faith. They just accept whatever the church officials tell them to accept. But he wants people to think about, why do we do this? Why do we believe in this or that? And his whole idea, it wasn't to like overthrow the Pope or to create a new church or anything like that. He wants the Catholic Church to change, to become better, to reform itself, right? By raising up these questions and these complaints. Uh, and again, his main thing is the selling of indulgences. He didn't think that that was right. Because, and uh, this other practice called simony, where people are selling church offices. So you pay money and you get to become a cardinal or a bishop, right? And again, these positions of you know spiritual power were not supposed to be granted by the you know, highest bidder. So Luther is complaining about this. And his main thing is that it's not in the Bible. There is no indulgences in the Bible. There is no so many in the Bible. None of that, right? These are things invented by the Catholic Church, but it's not found in the Bible. So how can it be, you know, the Word of God, or how can it be, you know, approved by God if it's not in the Bible? He thinks that all the answers about how the church should be run are in the actual text. So of course the Catholic Church goes crazy over him. Uh, they tell him to to stop, you know, saying these things. And first he says no, because this is the truth, because this is what I believe in. And he's put on trial, and he actually proves that like everything he argues is supported or backed up by information found in the Bible. Um, so he gains a lot of supporters, and those supporters start printing his writing, and that's the main one because there's been other, you know, critics before Martin Luther but not before the invention of the printing press uh, in Europe, right? And with the printing press, he's able to publish all his writings and his defenses, and people are able to read it because he doesn't write it in Latin. He writes it in German and in other vernacular languages. So he starts, uh, he's told to be quiet, he, re he rejects it, they excommunicate him, he runs away, uh, but he's found support in Germany, right? The Germans, uh, especially in northern Germany, uh, they're going to start supporting Luther. Now, there's a kind of like a political thing here where a lot of the princes of Germany, because Germany was part of the Holy Roman Empire and it was very decentralized and the princes had a lot of power. And in an attempt to gain more power, they supported Luther because they meant separating from the church, the Catholic church. Um so over time, we see increased popularity behind Luther's teachings, right? And he, in fact, he translates the Bible to German so that people can read the Bibles for themselves, right? And his supporters become known as Lutherans, right? 
uh, and they're the first part or the first denomination, the first sect of what eventually becomes known as Protestants. So we're going to see a split within the Catholic Church in Europe, right, where we're going to see a split between the Protestants and the Catholics, right? And the main difference between Protestants and Catholics is that the Protestants do not accept the Pope as their leader. They have someone else, right? Or they have no leader at all. So you have Protestants, we have Catholics, right? Those are going to be the two major parts. But the Protestants are going to be divided. There's going to be a whole bunch of different types of Protestants, which we'll get to next. All right, so let's have a Lutheranism, right? So if you're a Lutheran, what is it that you believe in? So Luther, again, his popularity comes at the help of the printing press. Um, and, you know, even though the church and the Holy Roman Empire try to stop him, uh, information spread and the new religion gained greater support. So we see that most of the southern part of Europe, right, places like Spain, France, Italy, right, they're going to remain Catholic, while most of the northern part of Europe are going to divide uh, into the different Protestant sects, right? And the Reformation, we're going to see strong, more strongly found in the northern part of Europe. So again, uh, the Protestant Reformation is that the, he's looking for uh, reforms against the church. When those fail, he starts his own church. Now, some people kind of like latched on to Luther's kind of like Reformation. They're like, yeah, let's overthrow everything. And there's like these peasants in Germany who are like, you know, rioting. And they're like, yeah, let's kill all the lords and nobles and take their land. And Luther's like, no, that's not me. Uh, and he doesn't support them and they all eventually get killed. Um, now, one unique thing about Luther is that he believed that um, he believed that uh, women had equal access to God, which is you know, more of a Christian thing, Christian belief. Um, but there wasn't nuns. There is no monasticism uh, in Lutheranism, uh, unlike Catholicism, right? So women who, you know, Catholic women used to have a choice, you know, they could become a nun, but Lutheran women, they don't have that choice. That's not an option for them. All right, so another major sect or part of the Protestant Reformation is a group of uh, is a religion called Calvinism, right? So all these different religions, they're all Christian religions, right? Because they all fall under the big umbrella of Christianity, right? But they're different from each other, and they're different from the Catholics, and they're different from the Orthodox. Anyway, so there's this guy called John Calvin. He's from Switzerland, uh, and he starts teaching his version of Christianity. It becomes known as Calvinism, and it has is very very strict, right? Uh, so there's very strict guidelines you have to follow about your appearance and what you eat and what you can do and who you hang out with and that sort of stuff. But his main kind of like major belief is two things. One is the idea of predestination. So basically this idea is that God has already chosen or predetermined who's going to get to go to heaven. So there's nothing you can really do or say that will afford you or give you the chance to go to heaven. You've already been chosen, right? But there's a way to prove that you are chosen. You are one of the chosen ones. And that's through work, right? So if you work really hard at life, at saving and reinvesting your money and getting a bigger farm and getting more land, right? That's all proof that God has chosen you because he's giving you all these rewards. So we see that the Calvinists and other Protestants are going to adopt this work ethic to work hard and invest, make money and work hard and invest and make money and work hard and invest and make money to prove that they're the chosen ones. That God has blessed them. And we see this idea will transplant right, with the arrival of the pilgrims, a.k.a. the Puritans into North America, right? So we see the Protestant work ethic take hold in Europe. So here we see some of the major differences um, in, um, in the beliefs of Catholicism, Lutheranism, and Calvinism, right? Uh, so you don't really need to know all the major ones, but here they are in case you want to know 
what they are. All right, uh, so again, kind of quick history. Uh, originally, we had the early Christian church, right? Uh, by 1050, it's split between Catholics and Orthodox. Uh, by the 1600, it's split between all the different sects or all those different sects, I mean, of the Protestant uh, wing of the church, right? So by 1600, we have Orthodox, we have Catholics, and all the different Protestant ones that are in there, that follow in their Protestantism. Now, the last one, and kind of the most unique one, is Anglicanism. And Anglicanism is, is in England. Uh, and it's founded by this guy. Uh, he's King Henry VII, or Henry VIII, I should say, uh, of England. And he's married to the, the, this lady from Spain. Spain is super Catholic. And he doesn't like her. And she doesn't give him a male son. They have a daughter, they have two daughters, but not a male son. Um, sorry, one daughter. And um, so he wants a male son, a uh, male heir, and he, she, she is unable to provide him that. So he says, well, I'm going to get a new wife, uh, so I want a divorce. But church law says, Catholic church law says, you, you know, you can't get a divorce. That once it's a divorce, it's final, it's for life. And the king says, all right, forget that. So I'm going to create a new religion. And that's what he does. He creates the Anglican Church. And he puts himself, the King of England, at the head of the Church of England. Uh, so England splits from Rome. It splits from the Catholic Church uh, and causing a lot of problem in, in the wake. Um, but they don't really, it's not more of a philosophical or, or religious beliefs like Lutheran or Anglican or um, uh, like Luther or Calvinism. Uh, it's more for political reasons, right? They wanted to separate because the king wanted to have a fling with his mistress. Uh, and then he gets married and uh, she, you know, the next wife doesn't give him a male heir. So she kills her. Then he gets another wife and another wife and another wife. Uh, and most of them get killed. And um, so the Church of England is going to keep a lot of the same traditions of the Catholic Church. Uh, and a lot of people didn't uh, so like a lot, so they keep like the same like positions like they have bishops and stuff like that they keep the same traditions um, and the same like beliefs so there is not too much of a difference between the Anglican and Catholic Church and in fact some people in England they called separatists they didn't like that they didn't think that it was you know that was they felt that they had to separate more from the Catholics and those separatists eventually are going to um, want to leave England altogether. Um, and some of them will, will come with uh, the pilgrims and stuff. All right, uh, so we have the Protestant Reformation, we have Martin Luther, we have uh, Luther's beliefs, we have the Calvinist religion, and of course we have the Anglican religion, uh, all because one guy wanted to get remarried over and over with a younger, hotter wife. All right, so that's it for part one. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you again in the next part, part two.